Hello, this video is a small portion of a complete comprehensive video. If you'd like to see this complete comprehensive case and many other complete comprehensive cases, click on the link in the description below. So let's talk about what makes this wisdom tooth such a difficult extraction. Getting access to section this tooth was very difficult because of the second molar. You know, getting a handpiece in here to section it was complicated because when you section the tooth, you want to section to the furcation and you see the angle You'd like to section the tooth straight through the coronal part of the tooth to the furcation. In this case, I had to section in this direction in the distal part of the crown. The fact that the coronal, the mesial coronal part of the crown was actually on the facial aspect of the second molar. Again, just making it so difficult to get to and so difficult to elevate. The fact it was completely impacted, you can see the bone on the coronal part of the tooth and completely impacted distally. And then here's the inferior alveolar nerve. You've always got to keep that in mind when extracting mandibular impacted teeth, wisdom teeth. And then if you're subscribed to DentistryMasterClasses.com, I'm also going to go have a videos of extracting the other three wisdom teeth. So this is the lower left to 23 year old male. Now this is another reason of why if you're going to remove wisdom teeth, you'd like to do it when the wisdom tooth is about, when the roots are about 25% formed. You don't want to do it when the patient's so young that you only have the coronal part of the tooth because it'll just spin when you try to elevate it. You'd like to have about 25 to 30 percent of the roots formed which keeps this piece from spinning. You can elevate it and it's you know just when you have completely formed roots that's a difficult wisdom tooth. So local anesthesia, you can see he couldn't open real wide either because uh, he'd been having some trouble with his wisdom teeth. There was some inflammation back there. So I'm showing how I'm going to create the space, section to the furcation, elevate the distal piece, and then elevate the mesial piece. So it's easier drawn than actually done. So I'm making my cut along the ramus. Don't make your cut past the lingual of the second molar. You don't want to damage the lingual nerve. So keep it on the ramus. So cut here, cut here, and then I'm going to cut through here. And that's called a distal wedge. So when you remove the tooth, you've got a space and you've got more tissue than you need. And that allows you to close the flap completely. So I'm reflecting adjacent to the second molar and using the scissors to cut up the ramus just to remove the periosteum. Then this is a number four or six long shank round burr and I'm removing the occlusal part of the bone to gain access to the wisdom tooth. And so see it's turn it's on this side on the facial side of the second molar. A part of it's on the second facial side of the second molar. You can see the tooth is out here. So the access to section it and to remove the distal bone or the distal part of the tooth is very tight because of the second molar. You want to be careful not to touch the second molar. Very important to have a good radiograph so you have a visualization of where the tooth is. With a periapical radiograph, you really won't know so much if it's on the facial or the lingual of the second molar until you uncover the coronal part of the tooth by removing the occlusal, uh, occlusal bone. So I'm reflecting a little further so I can reflect a big flap and have access to the tooth.
you want to try not to traumatize the soft tissue with your burr. So I'm reflecting the periosteum, again going up the ramus, because you, you don't get a complete sense of how big the tooth is and exactly where it is until you gain access to the occlusal part of the tooth. So I'm seeing that it's quite a bit facial, part of it, a third of the tooth is facial to the second molar. Like I said, I'm not, this is not a teaching video to teach you how to do this. It's like watching a movie. You really, I don't suggest you try one of these unless you've had considerable surgical hands-on training. A horizontal impaction is twice as easy as a tooth angled like this one, especially if the roots are fully formed. Now I'm sectioning the tooth from the distal occlusal down to the frication in this cut right here. Then I'm creating access on the facial. And again, you can cut the bone or you can cut the tooth. I'm trying to remove tooth structure because we're going to lose the tooth anyway. And then I'm cutting behind the distal of the tooth to create a space to move the distal root and the distal coronal part into. If you don't have a space, you can't elevate that piece of the tooth. So see, I'm trying to section to the frication. I want to know about how far that is. So from the coronal part of the tooth to the frication is about 10 millimeters. So I know I don't want to go more than 10 millimeters from the coronal to the frication. Because you don't want to take any chance at all of damaging that inferior alveolar nerve. That's why in surgery we've always said if you have a root tip less than a third of the root and it's a mandibular wisdom tooth that's impacted, you, especially if it's impacted, you may want to leave the root because you want to do no harm. What's the worst thing that could happen? You sever or damage that nerve and the patient have a numb lip. They can live with a root tip that's up to a third of the root. So don't be a hero if the root fractures and think you've got to remove all of the root. You can leave up to a third of the root and that's not going to cause, a, I've never seen that cause a problem with an impacted wisdom tooth. You don't want to do sloppy surgery and leave parts of the tooth in there if you can get it out, but in a, you know, in a case like this if, that's got such an impacted wisdom tooth, if the root were to fracture, try to get it, but don't take a chance on damaging the inferior alveolar nerve. Again, I'm going a little further up the ramus just to create a big flap so I've got access. You can see the distal piece is elevating, but there's so much for this piece to bump into the distal of the socket and the distal of the mesial coronal part that I'm having to remove more of the two structures. See here's the, the two pieces and I'm trying to move the mesial piece too just seeing which one will come, e come out easier. Because once I've got the space I can either move the mesial piece into the distal root crown space or move the distal piece into the mesial root crown space. So ideally you'd rather remove the distal root and distal coronal part first. So that's the distal, see here's the distal, or here's the, you know, this is the distal of that distal piece. It's distal to the distal piece. I'm trying to move that up but it's hitting the distal part of the socket. So I'm creating a little more space in the section part and then I'm cutting the distal part of the distal crown 
off so I can elevate it and it doesn't hit the back of the socket. So there's the distal root and the distal part of the crown. I've sectioned through to the rotation. That's the back part. So it's moving. You want it to, you can't get in a hurry. You've got to, the harder it gets, the slower I go because I don't want to fracture the root. I want the piece to come out in toto if I can. So there's that distal root and the distal part of the crown. Now I've got to remove the mesial part and it's complicated because it's so wedged in to the distal of the second molar. I was hoping it would just lift out, but the coronal part's actually bumping the distal of the second molar, so I've got to remove some of the mesial part of the wisdom tooth crown to allow it to go up past the second molar. See, so now I've actually drilled a hole straight into the mesial coronal part and placing, I'd place this instrument to try to remove that mesial piece. It's got several places that are stuck. This part right here is sticking on the distal part of the socket. And then the mesial part of that piece is bumping the second molar. So I've got to remove part of the distal and the mesial of the crown just to create, just to get rid of those pieces so they're not bumping the distal part of the socket and the distal of the second molar. So you can see I'm getting movement, but here's the distal part of that piece I'm removing because it's hitting this back part of the socket. And it's just, it wants to go, but I can't move it forward because the crown is hitting the distal of the second molar. And I can't move it backward because the distal part of this coronal piece is hitting the back part of the socket. So I'm having to remove the distal and the mesial of the coronal part. Again, just creating space, just moving bits of that piece so it will elevate. And here it comes. I'm going to remove the follicular, follicular sac. And so here's how it fits together, both the roots. And then we're going to pack it. I've never had a dry socket in 40 years because I pack the mandibular impacted wisdom teeth with this paste and surgical gauze every time at the time of surgery. And what that does, it creates a matrix to hold the clot in there. That's what a dry socket is. When you lose the clot, the nerve endings in the bone are exposed. So if you maintain the blood clot with the resorbable gauze and the medicated paste, they won't lose the blood clot. So I'm gonna put two or three stitches down here since I've reflected a pretty large flap. You want to suture that tight. This is 3-0 plain gut suture and it'll dissolve in four to seven days. You can use chromic gut and that'll dissolve in two weeks. The only problem with chromic gut, it's got the ends poking out and it irritates the patient's tongue. Four to seven days is fine for a surgery like this. You don't want to do these kind of surgeries without a very good assistant that knows what they're doing. You wouldn't begin to do this without an assistant, I don't think, and I wouldn't want to do it without an assistant that was experienced and really, like I said, knew what they were doing. So there it is, sutured tight. So now we're going to extract the upper wisdom tooth. That's the dental minute. These techniques work and they work every time. I know you're ready. You are so ready. You are dying to take your dentistry practice to the highest level possible. 
but until right now, you haven't known how to do it. That's where DentistryMasterclasses.com steps in. At DentistryMasterclasses.com, you will get Dr. Kepper's greatest work and his best cases. Here's everything included at DentistryMasterclasses.com. You will get incredible, comprehensive cases not seen in Dental Minute videos, an organized library of all of the Dental Minute videos and Dentistry Masterclasses comprehensive cases for study and reference, and you will get before and after photos of Dr. Kepper's fantastic restored cases. All of this, all of this is only 40 bucks a month. It will change your life and change your practice. Go to DentistryMasterclasses.com and subscribe today.